Okay, I think we're going to get started uh, this evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Mabel Wilson, and I direct the Advanced Architectural Research Program uh, here at the GSAPP. And um, one of the things we should remember is that architects not only design these days, but they're also essentially responsible for developing new forms of expertise. Leading the field in the innovation and experimentation, GSAPP's research laboratories focus on three interrelated initiatives. And I think this is some of what you'll see from the five labs out of, I think, roughly 15 labs in the school that have to do with the development of new technologies and fabrication methods, cultural analysis of local and global conditions, uh, the investigation of urbanization and its environmental and social impacts. To more directly involve these research laboratories in the educational mission of the school, GSAPP offers a program in Advanced Architectural Research, um, AAR, um, for recent graduates who work with faculty and lab directors on a one-year applied research project. So this has been happening basically for the last three years. The labs offer a platform for the exchange of innovative ideas and for collaboration between the different labs' fields of expertise. Tonight, we will hear from the lab directors who will discuss the role of research in the various institutional, what I would call food groups of the GSAPP, which is architecture planning um, and urban design. Now, for advancing architectural research 2.0, because we did a, a similar event last year that involved China Lab and C Lab, um, I thought it would be useful to shift the focus on what the labs do, um, which was what they discussed last year, to really, um, how do the labs work? Uh, in research, uh, you know, one of the questions we might ask is research a form of practice or is it markedly different? Does practice, because of its prospective nature, already engage in research? Tonight, each lab director will briefly discuss the methods and influences on how he, she conducts the, the lab's initiatives through one or more projects. We have asked them to also consider if they've adopted research methodologies from, for instance, engineering, from computer science, the social sciences, art practices, new media, and so forth. More importantly, we want them to consider how are these techniques adopted to methods of architectural design to hybridize new methodologies of investigation. One key question in all of this is if through this cross-fertilization, these new hybrid forms of research offer new modes and models of inquiry to other disciplines, fields, and practices. So we will hear from five of the GSAPP labs tonight. Phil Anzalone is the director of building technologies at the GSAPP. He directs the new initiative CBIP and directs the Avery Digital Fabrication Lab with Scott Marble. The Fab Lab has made a shift toward expansive forms of digital production within the, de the design and construction industry. This recalibration of goals affords the opportunity of not only reconfiguring the relationships between the key players, but also incorporating industry sectors not typically associated with building construction. Toro Hesegawa directs the newly formed Cloud Lab with Mark Collins. Together, they also head Proxy, which is an innovation focused design firm that works across a range of scales and platforms. Toro has worked as an architect in New York City and Tokyo. Since founding Proxy in 2006 with Mark, Toro has worked to explore the potentials within the computational paradigm for a range of clients from individuals to institutions and including the aforementioned fab labs and other labs within the school. The Urban Landscape Lab is dedicated to affecting positive social and eco ecological change in the joint built natural environment. We will be joined by Jeanette Kim, who is an architectural designer and educator based in New York. She is also a principal of all of the above in architectural research and design practice. Jeanette's uh, practice research and teaching focus on the construction of ecologies in relationship to representations of public identity. We are also, along with Jeanette, joined by Urban Lab's other director, Kate Orr, who is a registered arch landscape architect and an active design practitioner in her office, SCAPE. She leads studios and seminars at the GSAPP that integrate the earth sciences into the design curriculum. Sarah Williams co-directs 
the Spatial Information Design Lab with Laura Kurgan. Before coming to the GSAPP, Sarah was at MIT where she started the GIS laboratory. She has also worked with MIT's Sensible, since ABLE, sorry, uh, City Laboratory, which is a joint program between MIT's Media Lab and Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Sarah has 13 years of experience with GIS, dating back to her early work with Clark Labs uh, and the IDRIS project. And lastly, Columbia's, but not least, <laughs> Columbia's Moving uh, Image Lab is directed by filmmaker and architect Mothern Ratnam. In addition to the lab, Mothern is the director of LNNO Studio and a PhD research candidate in the School of Architecture and Design at RMIT University in Australia. MILK, a project-based research lab, explores the role of film and animation in architecture and design. Well-versed in the debates around design research, Mothern taught this year's AAR research methodologies course and has graciously agreed to moderate the discussion for this evening's panel. So thank you for coming and let the games begin. Bill. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Philip Anzalone. Um, I'm the Scott Barber Lab Director at the Liberty Digital Fabrication Lab. Sorry. Um, and uh, the, the idea of um, showing how we work threw me a little bit. Um, because usually in the Fabrication Lab, we show what we've done, right? It's about making something. So um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, show a little of what we've done, but, but jump into what, how we work and showing a couple projects that we've done. Um, where we go and actually uh, build something uh, someplace else in the world, let's say. So, um, you, know, you know, what we do, we have a lot of um, uh, sort of advanced software, of course, uh, as everybody does in the GSAPP. We play with a lot of cool materials, um, some very new materials, um, and uh, different types of systems. Um, we get to construct a lot of large things. And of course, we have the machinery, which is what everybody you know wants to play around with. Um, but you know, I have to be very careful to make sure that it's being played around with well. And this is an interesting um, image because I think that this is really on the machine. You can see it right there. Right? So um, if you want to see this image in its glory, you can go over to the fabrication lab. The um, the idea of the hand, I think, is kind of interesting in, in the concept of digital fabrication. This is where I want to, kind of want to go with, um, with a little bit of this discussion. Um, you know, the hand has a long history, of course, in architecture and so on. This is what the hands usually look like out of the fabrication lab. Um, so I want to show a few projects that we've done uh, in the lab um, in different methods, you know, research, student work, and so on. But you'll notice there's always the, the, the pretty object, right? And then, and then how, it, you know, how it has to be done, right? How we work, I guess, right? Um, everybody seems happy. There's Toru. Right up there. Gotcha. <laughs> Usually it's me standing around, right? So this time I got gotcha. Um, and there's some examples that are still around today. Sometimes it's a single person. Um, sometimes it's more. Uh, sometimes we're doing things we're not supposed to be doing in the school. Sometimes things are not quite all that digitally fabricated, right? Um, sometimes it's dangerous, right? Um, and basically, uh, usually involves a lot of people, right? Um, sometimes it's a, f a small amount, but for larger projects, there's a lot of people. Uh, what I want to talk about is a couple of projects that we've done uh, very quickly uh, related to uh, trips that we do. We go abroad uh, and we um, build something with another school. Uh, this is the first one in Torino, and then we also did one that you'll see in Madrid. The interesting thing about that, and the reason why it's, uh, it struck me as what I should show for how we work, is um, the, the goal behind it is that it's not just about digital fabrication. In other words, the computer having the design work um, fed into it, and then it prints out something in a way, right? It's not about letting the machine actually take over. It has a lot to do with people. In fact, a lot of these projects, a lot of this doesn't even involve any digital fabrication at all. It becomes a bit construction, right? 
So um, we went to Torino. This is the School of Architecture in there, by the way, the building. Very nice, right? Um, we were a little jealous after that. Uh, this was the bike I rode around Torino, right, since it's going to be a little bit of a, of a um, show of... Um, of my, our trip. Uh, what, what happened is basically, you know, we get somebody to donate material, we get somebody to donate a space and an event and so on, and then we go and build something, right, at these locations. And, and it's a little bit different than digitally fabricated. We deal with the same concepts, right? Parametrics, um, surprisingly, and you don't have to digitally output them. Uh, we deal with a lot of solid modeling, a lot of analysis and so forth in different ways, as you'll see. Uh, we all get together. Uh, and build stuff and take a look at it the same way you would do on the computer, the same way you would do on the machine, except it's a lot of times by hand. Um, Robbie was surprised. I caught him in the act, just standing around. Um, you know, we build examples, right? Um, take them outside, see how they look in the context. Um, and then this is the location that, in this case, we were building an info center. So we're building a pavilion for an event. It's the world design capital. Uh, this was in Italy. There was let's say 12 Italian students, 12 uh, US students, and a few from other places around the world. This is Italy in the summer, right? So we learn a lot about the fact that you have to stay in the shade. So everybody's over here on the side. Uh, but finally, somebody has to get to work. And this is typical of anything. So Ingrid finally picked up the first piece, and everybody got to work. Digital prints, uh, a little bit of analog work, right? It's not all digital. But there's digital involved and, and all kinds of fabrication as well. A lot of sitting in the sun. I'm not sure who that is. Um, but eventually we come up with some detailing that has to deal with how uh, we would create something with the same sort of effect that we talk about. This is really a two-week project. We're there for two weeks only. Um, the same sort of effect that we've, uh, that we've used for a lot of the digital fabrication projects that come straight from the machinery. Right? Uh, but if you notice, there's a lot of handwork. This is a, I think it's an interesting project or set of projects because it allows uh, people to understand how the machine does exactly what you would do, just faster, differently, more precise, and so on. Um, so we start building things, right? Going in, taking photos. Da, da, da. I'm in an odd location here. Sorry about that. Um, so this was the, you know, the, this was the pavilion as it was working. But then, you know, we get on to what we learn in these kind of locations, like how to work at night, right? Because they did not have any lights at our location. Um, how to work uh, Italian style, I suppose. Um, how to roll up our shirts like um, U.S. construction workers, so we can show the Italians. Um, and we had a nice large location where we were able to give our presentation, which we don't have here in the U.S. or at least in New York, right? Um, Going on to Madrid, uh, at this location, uh, what happened is this was the second event that we did with the fabrication lab. So um, we started to play a little bit of an idea about how we could, um, how we could engage with the culture, how we could deal with um, how things are constructed differently, how the material is different in another location, and so on. So this is where how we work sort of started to gel as far as the idea of what these summer workshops would be. Torino was the first one. It was an experiment in, of sorts. We still had bikes, right? Um, you, you may recognize some of the people because it's getting closer to our year. And we all, um, we all went the same way, sat down, started to do design work in paper, same way as we do here as well, and then started to become more digital um, as, things, uh, as things proceeded. An interesting thing that this, um, this involves is the idea that uh, a lot of the fabrication projects that we've dealt with have to do, of course, with um, computational files, right, and a lot of the uh, methods of production and so on. And a lot of this gets split up and brought together um, into different groups. If you ever worked on a project together, of course, on a large project, you understand how you separate the work, how you bring it all back together, how you deal with this with the computer. It's no different when you're doing this by hand, in a way, than it is when you're doing this digitally. Um, with digital fabrication, I guess I should say, right? Um, so we had the same uh, the same issues. When you get to the material, you have to pick it up, you have to move it around, you have to get out the saw, um, cut things up, play around with it, lay things out for have discussions, right, about what we're doing and so on. Go back to the drawing board, as the old uh, phrase goes, right? And eventually come up with well, they were a little clunky at first, the the details, but we started to play around with how to make these things, right? completely out of the computer to our hands, in a way, and not necessarily um, through all of the machinery. There's Luke lifting. Um, and then we all had to join in on the game, right? Um, so the idea is exactly the same. 
the production is, is relatively similar, but we learned a lot about the precision and the methods of, of dividing up how things work in these, um, in these uh, workshops, right? So it was an exhibit for, uh, for a museum. So we eventually clad it just the same way as, um, as we do in those projects, and it had tapas, right? Um, but a few things that were interesting about this, um, this is, um, this is a, a very important point that I learned in Spain. Um, they vote about everything. I have no idea why, but, but I, I, just didn't, I just didn't quite understand it, being as we always say we're the democracy, right, in the world. Um, it's not really true. We had to vote about every move we made. So um, it, was a, it became very interesting that, you know, here's our voting, right? This is architecture by voting, very interesting method of, of production, right? Um, so this is a new way of working for me, which usually, you know, we don't vote on the computer, right? It, Morgan's not drinking. We learned how to um, cut things a little differently. Here we're drinking, right? Um, and uh, and you, as you can see, it's all by hand. Now, again, I showed all of the digital stuff uh, previously, and I'll show some more at the end. We learned about the Vitruvius Man. We learned a little bit of self-defense, how to break things if you don't have um, any any machines to break them with, and how to be careful that you don't cut your hand off, right? So there was still a lot of danger involved in all of this. Um, so I guess to sort of wrap up, it's a very quick presentation, and, um, and if anybody has uh, questions, of course, we'll be free to ask or to answer them at the end. One thing that all of this has taught a lot of us that worked on these is, in a way, the difference between, um, between the digital, the precision of the digital, and the um, imprecision of the hand, which, or the body, or whatever we want to call it, which I think is very interesting, right? Some of these projects that we've done that I showed at the beginning of the presentation um, have, have a degree of precision that the only way to really get them to work is to break out the hammer and actually start like forcing them to go together, right? There's a lot of things that are incorrect. It's hard to keep track of all this stuff, even with the computer, a lot of problems, a lot of missing things, a lot of bent pieces that should have been straight, right? And a lot of things are just plain wrong, right? So nonetheless, all of this digital fabrication has the ability to go you know, drastically wrong, even with the precision and the amount of tracking that you can do. Um, so in a way, I guess, you know, to sum it up at my 11 minute mark, is um, I think that uh, the, where, where I'm looking at some of the study in the lab itself is how we can um, merge the concepts of um, you know, this digital, completely um, non-touched fabrication, and then how we actually go about building things. And I guess that's it. The end. I'm Toru. Um, I'm directing this with uh, Mark Collins. Um, we're also actually starting the Apa Texture uh, Visual Studies class this uh, second half of the semester. Um, it just started literally um, in talking this semester, so I don't have as much slides as Phil does, um, but I'll, I'll go one by one of my three three slides. Now, we we all kind of know. Computers are everywhere, right? Like, there's one right here in front of me. I have an iPhone. Um, even your refrigerator or even your, you know, microwave has a computer in some way or another. Now, it's the ubiquitous networking or ubiquitous computing is this kind of notion that computer would pretty much be in anything, and we won't even kind of understand that it's a different entity of of us. So it could be in your clothes. It can be in our glasses. It can be pretty much in anything. Now, that said, the, the mission of this kind of uh, computer lab is somewhat to kind of expand that conversation of this kind of where, how do we think of this kind of new kind of reality we're engaged in, where we can access information or we can access, in, in some sense, all this resource, right? So the good example being the Folding at Home project by Stanford University, where it would tap into all PlayStations around the world to kind of reach a petaflop speed of which supercomputers can't even reach. So this kind of interesting condition where, you know, computers are out there can kind of gang together 
and become the fastest computer. So the access point to this kind of many computers is somewhat this, this cloud, right? We understand this cloud is this kind of collective of, of computers that are just it, there to be kind of consumed in a sense or even used. And another strategy where I would say that was used is like in the Obama campaign. Like there was no other way of distributing a kind of quantity of information or communication rather through this cloud. So kind of knowing the cloud is the kind of new, new kind of front, or let's say we can even say it's the new space that we should be starting to explore into or being able to kind of think of in that spatiality of beyond the three dimension or in this kind of multiple dimension. Um, Another example of that is, is the kind of um, DARPA's uh, initiative competition called the uh, uh, network, compu uh, network Challenge, where you would, the competition in itself was to be asked, there is gonna be 10 red balloons being launched somewhere in the United States, not knowing when it was going to be launched, and the first group to find all was the winner. Now, the winner being a, a group from MIT called the Human Dynamics Lab, um, launched its own kind of, I, I call it the Facebook plus microfinance strategy, where it would make its own network of saying, if you find it, you get $2,000. If you were an agent in the network that referenced that person, you get $1,000 and so forth. So that network strategy with finance was the captiva captivating strategy to find all 10. Now, the extent of the lab is that we do gauge in the scale of software. Now that, that is where you're, you're able to communicate in this cloud and being able to kind of uh, use that kind of uh, resource in, in kind of uh, any context, right? So these are all contexts that I just gave example. But for our cloud lab here at GSAP is to really think, well, what does that mean for architects and architectural design for space? Now we can kind of bring the, the concept of computing in, in the sense that now we're still used to kind of having our personal computers in front of us and we use it to design. But once that, that kind of personal interface is not the kind of case that it is already ubiquitous out there, it becomes a software problem of how do you kind of dis almost kind of have a dialogue between the kind of cloud you have and yourself. So our, our strategy here is to kind of gauge into this kind of software platform through mobile apps um, and to kind of give the first example. Now, I show this slide that it is really fresh. We're just starting to develop it. We still have many ideas on the table, kind of including what to consider. Obviously, many of the thoughts also include like supercomputing where when our resource of power on speed is beyond our usual computer, right? When you can add thousands of computers all together and start problem solving, that is a kind of entry point um, to our, our problem. Um, and lastly, let me just show, this is somewhat a, a reel to uh, kind of indicate what kind of research we're kind of trying to focus on is, well, just taking this example of the mobile phone where if you can already kind of augmently know where you are, uh, what direction you're looking at, um, keep that data tracking, um, it already opens up this kind of spatial problem for us that we've been always gauging up, gauging as a kind of architectural problem, but actually having that power through software to actually even construct it, distribute it, and even kind of data mine through that information. Um, so that is the kind of extent. Um, I'll just kind of uh, wait until this ends. But um, the, the kind of focal point, again, is kind of this media or this, uh, let's say, new spatial terrain, the, the cloud, where as architects we have to kind of start thinking of what is potentially possible because it's, it is somewhat an un, unkind of explored terrain for us. So we're kind of putting that onto the table and, um, and we're, we're kind of already kind of partnering with a few people, uh, including, um, including Ken Sakamura, which is probably one of the most uh, pioneered person in this kind of operating system um, uh, business where he was already thinking in the 70s, 80s of thinking of, well, 
once once we have computing power in everything, everything will converse with everything. So as humans, we would just become a part of that ecology of objects. So not only you speaking to an object, objects would be speaking to objects. So this is all through this kind of medium of software. So that's probably the best description I can give at this point. So our research are initially starting this semester of already thinking of, well, what is a GS, GS app? Now we're kind of calling it the um, app for the school where we're just launching this semester is to really think of, well, what is the media the school can start gauging in this cloud? What are, what are the issues that we can bring up and what are the kind of things we can start kind of computing? Um, so this is Cloud Lab and uh, I, I guess the extent is that people will kind of start joining the endeavor of the research um, and a part of that initiative, we, we start this architecture as well. Thank you. Okay, hi, I'm Kate Orff, and this is Jeanette Kim, and we're co-directors of the Urban Landscape Lab. And so, well, I mean, I guess it's pretty self-evident <laughs> from our mission statement, but we're really interested in looking at the city through the lens of, of landscape and, and kind of studying this kind of complex network of ecological processes and social um, issues that together form the diversity and bi biodiversity and social diversity of cities. And our work um, really has been diverse in terms of its methodology and output, and Jeanette's gonna talk a little bit about the methodology. But before we get to that, um, I thought it might be just interesting to see a cross-section of the past work. Um, our, our collaborations have kind of included um, uh, things like uh, the Bird Safe Design Guidelines, a sort of set of design guidelines that led towards incorporating bird safe ideas into a lead, uh, potential lead point that were accepted by the Audubon Society, um, um, a, a report um, with the Spatial Information Design Lab about um, Gateway National Recreation Area, um, a charrette for uh, the city of Newark, um, which is called This is Newark, and um, you know things like aquaponic prototyping and and, and basically, Jeanette and I are also now working on combining the work of our studios and seminars towards generating sort of new forms of um, uh, educational dialogue and research. Um, and I guess with that, why don't, oh, I wanted to say importantly though that I think maybe very, very important for our lab is also this notion of, of collaboration and actually the network of people who work with us because, um, very important to us is this notion that in order to kind of create cultural change, which I know that sounds kind of crazy, but, but you know, in order to like engage with the world, you actually have to build up sort of networks of, um, of dialogue. And so not an, only an intelligence that exists within the school, but one that is constantly sort of interfacing with, um, you know, the, the sort of realities of, of New York City and city agencies and so on. So a lot of it, of, of our interest uh, is at this exists at this intersection of, of sort of research within the academy and in, in, and interface with um, the institutions and so on that that make up um, the larger city. So, go. so Kate and I decided to focus our talk today mostly on Safari Seven, and we'd like to ex introduce the project to you and talk a bit about the research methods that that really brings to the discussion. And I think in many ways, um, the project is, um, what, what we'd like to really focus on is this idea that research isn't sort of just uh, the process of observation, but is also really a process of outreach um, and is a process that kind of builds up um, ways of collaborating, ways of, of joining knowledge together. So um, as a brief introduction, um, Safari 7 is a project that focuses on animal life along the number seven train line here in, in New York City. Um, and the project distributes um, podcasts and, um, and maps along the seven line that were intended to be used on the train um, as a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, park ranger or as a kind of uh, mobile tour of the city. 
Um, the project really focuses on um, the kind of uh, biodiversity of the city that often goes under-recognized um, and really focuses on this idea that animal life um, and the ecosystems of the city are not just things that happen within parks or fringes of the city, but are really things that happen right in your backyard, um, really right in your kitchen, um, right, sort of the most intimate spaces of the city. Um, we really focus on this idea of the mashup, um, which is a way of kind of linking um, animals to each other in ways that we might not always see, um, and also as ways of kind of linking human um, life to animal life. Um, so just for a, f a couple of examples, some of our podcasts and, and maps um, focus, for example, on Utan Island here in the East River, which was created from um, uh, landfill or from rubble from the number seven train uh, Steinway Tunnel uh, construction, um, and sort of created this whole chain reaction of um, bird life on the island, um, which is itself also influenced by levels of DDT that have been changing throughout New York's harbor. Um, or in another example, we look at Flushing Meadows um, and this kind of sort of arrests a really surprising kind of network of reactions. Um, uh, stemming from the cold, old, uh, old use of this land as um, an ash dump, uh, moving on to Robert Moses's kind of grand, grand master plan for the site, and moving on to really unexpected um, uh, um, kind of new clashes of animal life, uh, ranging from the kind of amazingly bizarre frankenfish that can survive for like, uh, I forget, eight hours out of water, um, to this kind of clash of geese and airplanes that we heard of um, um, with the U.S. Air, um, uh, uh, air airplane crash in the Hudson last year. Um, so really the concept of the project is to use the subway itself as the site for exploration. And we really focus on this idea of kind of using the car as a kind of eco-classroom. Um, as this kind of place for um, where you sort of become a park ranger and both kind of observe and direct new tours through the city. Um, so really in order to do this, we sort of had to become park rangers ourselves. And um, as Kate mentioned, um, Safari 7 is, an, is uh, very much a team effort. Um, a lot of the podcasts began in the Barnard Columbia um, undergraduate program of architecture where I teach a seminar on urban ecology. And a lot of the podcasts came from students working there. Um, and in many ways, um, Safari 7 is, it kind of adopts this kind of frame of journalistic research. Um, we, we do our own background research to every podcast, um, but we also really um, make sure to form new knowledge by um, speaking with people, doing interviews, um, kind of gathering knowledge that people have of neighborhoods, um, um, and combine them with knowledge that scientists have. So this is an example of uh, Lisa Eckley um, going on a trip with Stephen Handel um, through Sunnyside Yards, um, where he, he did a, a kind of podcast walk um, of, of weed life and plant life um, along this kind of abandoned um, site. Um, this is also a tour that um, Helen Kongsgaard, one of our team members, did with James Denoff Berg, who's an ecologist um, who explained um, kind of mass um, studies that he and his students did throughout the city, um, like laying down traps to see how insects were gathering in different places, understanding how ants live along highway medians. Um, so he really explored, explained not only his research, but his research methods as well. Um, and this expands in a number of directions where um, this is um, uh, uh, a young Safari 7 team member, <laughs> who some of you might recognize, who. Um, um, decided, he got so excited about the project that he decided to make his own and for the number one train. Um, so we start to have kind of new mappings um, emerge out of the project and we're starting to uh, run some education projects um, with some um, local education groups um, in Queens. And, um, and I think this really gets to this kind of question of citizen science that, um, that the project becomes a kind of frame um, to collect and, and, and uh, kind of uh, instigate knowledge from uh, people of, of, a di of a wide range of backgrounds. And this is just one example of a photograph that was sent to us uh, by this woman, Julia Churchuk, who lives in Jackson Heights. And this is a photograph of this hawk on her, um, on her um, fire escape. Um, and one of the next steps also for us is to do a map with Sarah Williams on mushrooms in the city. Um, and we're collaborating with this group called Stratospore, um, a group of artists and uh, mycologists and dancers and chefs who um, work on, who look at mushroom life in the city. 
and for me, it really raise, raises this kind of question of the potentials um, and also the kind of challenges of sci citizen science. Um, we're going to connect to this database called NOAA, um, which is kind of has set up a really fantastic interface with which you can kind of upload information about animals. And this was sort of my example of like bad crowd, uh, the, the site's fantastic, but this one example is sort of my example of like the problems of crowdsourcing that we would find like trees really blurry, you know, and it, it, it sort of raises the question of like the resolution, the kind of um, depth of knowledge that you can get. The amazing thing though is that through kind of comments and um, added knowledge and kind of uh, sort of uh, uh, added interest in this idea of kind of scouting your own city, gathering knowledge and collecting it, that I think these things will change over time. And I think um, we can really start to build more precise knowledge as we go. So Kate. Great, well, I mean, just to, just to build on that idea, I mean, now that Safari 7 um, has, has basically, because it, it intersects these kind of two major facets of sustainability, that is sort of public transport and the environment and, and ecology, that it's really received a lot of attention, um, I would say, from a lot of different types of groups and, and people. And um, so one of the things we're interested in in engaging AAR program with is actually brainstorming with us and brainstorming with you about the future of this project. Um, this is actually the one of the manifestations that our work took on in New York and we were working also with Glenn Cummings of MTWTF on this project in terms of the outreach piece. And um, so we actually did an installation at, at Studio X um, here in Lower Manhattan um, of the work. This is an example of a literal mashup of literally <laughs> kind of two different, um, well, this is a failed, <laughs> broken mashup, but the, the, the project included sort of um, a map table, um, these sort of um, sections and um, mashups that, that talked about these sort of in, you know, it collisions, if you will, of sort of urban systems and natural systems. And so this was our first kind of attempt at outreach, which is a party. And so we had a really big party um, downtown. Um, with the idea that this Safari 7 reading room was essentially kind of an orientation space where you could sort of learn about the city, download some podcasts, and then go out and ride the train and take the safari. And so that was um, uh, a, a sort of place where you could get oriented, and here's some of those elements on display. Um, and so now we're, again, we want to understand, you know, what, what is the future of Safari 7? We have this sort of database and mapping um, project. And we've also um, reached an agreement with the MTA here in New York to now um, actually incorporate Safari 7 as their kind of keystone um, project for MTA for Earth Day. So we, we have a million Metro cards that are being printed next month. And um, we have an exhibit now that's going to be up in uh, Vanderbilt. So we're really interested in reaching out to students and to all of you to help us lead some tours and, and kind of brainstorm about what that sort of Earth Day event could be. Um, another direction that's been very exciting for, for, for us in terms of thinking about the future of this project is how we can take the frame of Safari 7 and start to engage other global cities where Columbia is now establishing um, a sort of Studio X presence. So I'm sure that the Studio X will be a topic of great discussion, um, hopefully when we're up here at the front, but um, that's another direction that we're fa fascinated with and that we really love to engage students or um, AAR students with in terms of brainstorming about um, how this frame could begin to engage other cities, other environments. And so finally, before we close, um, a new, another new initiative of the, the lab is reaching out and working with um, the Mary Miss studio. And um, if you know the artist, Mary Miss, the environmental artist, um, she's been um, working with um, people in the city of New York and trying to develop prototype projects that engage artists and scientists um, along Broadway as a kind of um, uh, a way of, of reframing um, New York City as a sort of a 21st century sustainable city. So another potential in terms of AR research next year would be working with Jeanette and I and also Mary on, um, on that project. So with that, we'll close and look forward to the discussion. OK, 
Okay, um, my name is Sarah Williams and I co-direct the Spatial Information Design Lab with uh, Laura Kurgan. And what I thought I would focus, this one real quick. Um, the talk today is about our methodology in the lab. Um, we asked about how we work and I think one of the interesting things about the Spatial Information Design Lab is um, some of the methods that we use. Um, and the, our methods are, um, our methodological approach uses data about places to expose social and environmental issues that might not have otherwise been seen. Um, and really at the core of that definition, I would say is the use of data to expose kind of the underlying systems of a place. And so some of the methods I think that are core methods in the lab are techniques for collection of unique data sets, unique forms of analysis, particularly spatial analysis, and unique forms of visualization. Um, and when we kind of bring those even further down, we have, we use, I think what's really special about some of the methodological approaches of the lab is the use of quantitative analysis or quantitative techniques that you might find in statistics or social sciences or quantitative methods combined with visual representation. And so, so in each project that we work on, we really try to think about the dichotomy between those two. And I think often um, in data visualization projects, you see just visualization. You don't see kind of the quantitative methods um, behind it. And so I always try to do the statistical analysis and also do the visualization so that if a hard scientist is gonna look at our data, it makes sense to them, but it also looks um, representationally interesting. So if we take one project that I think that might explain that the best, um, and one of the things that Mabel asked us to do is kind of think about where you draw your methods from. And so I think um, one place that we draw a lot of methods from are from social sciences and geography. I'm a geographer and by training, so um, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, and one project that uh, we often look at um, kind of different phenomena in space. And so one of the statistics that I employ a lot in my work is the Geddes Ord or hotspot statistic. I don't know, maybe I'll just explain what that is through a project. Um, so here's um, a project that we did, which was the geography of buzz. And in this project, um, this is a, this map actually shows the the hotspot statistic, um, and it's showing that there's a clustering of theater events in Midtown or what we think of as the theater district, which makes sense. But what's unique about this project is that we collected the data from the Getty Image Repository. So we actually went into the database, scraped all of their information out of the Getty photos um, to tell us where events were happening in the city. And we created a database out of those events. And we had latitude and longitude, which is our spatial points, which allowed us to plot each event. And these are all, kind of all the events in New York City. The circles represent how many photos were taken at different events. So once we had those, that data plotted about arts and culture events in the city, we were able to make maps such as this um, that shows us where the events clusters. And what we did is we actually ran a spatial statistics on this. And this is probably not as interesting to some people, but is really interesting to social sciences is that we found um, using the global Moran's eye statistic that we had significant clustering in different types of arts and culture events, um, which was illustrated through um, our different visualizations. So that's one way that we use um, methods. Um, and what we found was that arts and cultural events in New York and Los Angeles tend to cluster around um, what people would think of as iconic architecture in those spaces. So they might not be hot spots. So one of the hot spots that we found is um, Times Square in New York. How many people really think of Times Square as a place to go as New Yorkers? So what we found is that the Getty Image Database is really clustering around 
places that you iconically think of in those cities. So in New York, it was Fifth Avenue, Midtown, Times Square. In Los Angeles, it was Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and Sunset Strip. And so what we found by mapping the places where images were taken, we found how, how media represents space and or uses architecture um, as a way to sell product um, through the images. Um, as I mentioned before, so one of the things that I think is unique about what we do is quantitative analysis, but also collection techniques or different types of collection techniques. So the Getty is one example of an interesting collection technique in that we scrape data off of a database, but we also draw from other types, uh, other fields for collection techniques. And so we draw from computer science and geography again. In this project in Beijing, we created air quality sensors um, that collect information about air quality by place. And so as you're moving through the city, um, you're collecting different air quality information. So this is actually Jen's path one day um, with the air quality sensor that we created uh, for her. Um, and this is another path uh, that she took one day. Um, and we hooked these up with a cell phone technology so that um, once the data is collected by the GPS and air quality, it's submitted back to a main server using SMS message uh, technology or cell phone technology. Um, and the sensors use GPS devices, and this is a particular matter uh, sensor for that. And one of the things that we did in this project was really measure smog. Um, and we looked at the particles during the Beijing Olympics. Um, and so the way that this works is similar in that you collect the X and Y coordinate um, by time, and then this is actually a reading of the um, CO at that time. Um, and so the database is then translated spatially. Um, these maps were featured in the New York Times. This is actually um, during the Beijing Olympics, they put in a uh, reduction of cars on the road. So some days had if your license plate had an even number, you would be on the road, and if you had an odd number. This is before the car mandate was put in place. This was after, so you saw some decrease in um, uh, carbon emissions, and uh, this is New York for the same time. So we were able to use the device to, cr to follow, and this is the marathon route, to get an idea of how the athletes might um, feel as they run along the Olympic route. So when we found with the carbon emissions data is that um, air quality for carbon improved, but we actually found that um, we also did another reading at the Olympic Park Tenement Square in the Temple of Heaven, and we found readings that were much higher for particulate matter. So the uh, enforcement for cars helped with carbon uh, emissions, but particulate matter was still very high. So the red here is actually showing you particulate matter, and you can see in some cases it's, you know, 20 times higher than it would be in uh, New York is yellow and London is um, orange. This is the World Health Organization standards for developing countries right here. <laughs> so you can see how much higher the particulate matter was. And this is the Olympic start. You can actually see the during the track and field events, and I don't know if anybody remembers the Olympics, but it was raining a lot during that time, and so that's why the levels are much lower uh, during that. Um, and data can be um, quantitative, but it can also be visual. So we took images every day, um, and so these images are a part of our what we consider data um, when we talk about the lab being uh, focused on data. But you can see. Um, on opening day, it was the uh, particulate matter was 13 times higher than it was in uh, New York City. But in some cases, it was actually lower. Um, and there's lots of speculation of why that is. And one of the speculations is that the Chinese government was actually seeding the clouds during the last week to, to if it rains, then the particulate matter would actually come down um, to the ground. But um, those are speculation. Um, visualization is also uh, another component of kind of how we think or our methods and we really draw I think also from art design and I always put geography because there's 
um, kind of a history of cartographic representation that comes out of geography, which I think very much relates to art and design. Um, and so in this project, um, the Million Dollar Blocks project, we took data about where prisoners lived before they went to prison, and we were able to map those data um, and quantify how much money was being spent um, each year to incarcerate people by city blocks. So the red dots, uh, red blocks show you where over a million dollars was spent to incarcerate prisoners from one year. Um, and if you look at this one community, you can see that these 12 blocks have almost over uh, 12 million dollars spent on them in one year. Um, but they also lack a lot of city services. Um, and through a project like that, we actually worked on um, ex another method that I would say is kind of more urban planning scenario planning where we brought together people that would think about this community, um, and this is Brownsville in New York, and we asked them to think about um, different strategies that they might think in architectural representation um, that could help alleviate, I mean, if you had $1 million to spend on this community, how would you spend it is basically the question. And we brought people from the community together um, to ask this question. We used more traditional data set here, census data um, and government data to look at Community District 16 to say, to kind of explore what is going on there along with community members, criminal justice activists, um, and so forth. Um, and we had food stamp recipients, violent crime, inference, parole information, general information, population moves since 1995, people of color, and so forth. And we asked people to come together and think about the data, what's there in the community, and what changes m might be facilitated by that. Um, and from that, we created um, a series of pamphlets that talked about possibilities for uh, policy for re-entry programs. Um, so another, um, and my final project, I think I'm getting close on my time here, um, is I think we draw some of our work from social media. Um, and again, this is a kind of, I think some of the methods we use here are borrowed from computer science and geography. And in this project, um, the Cripple Bush Ghost Tour, um, we were interested in the names behind place and how to expose that in a different type of way. So in this project, if you came across a sticker, I told you why a particular street was named something or a park. In this case, the ghost of John and James Lorne were grand lawyers and local real estate speculators in the 1830s with less than savvy reputation. So we wanted to kind of think about how you can expose place um, through a different type of technology. So um, we did a series of research where we looked at the names behind certain places in Williamsburg. So we found out um, what Leonard Street was named, what Roebling Street was, um, Macri Square. Um, and we put those together and we put stickers up across the neighborhood that said a ghost lives here. Um, and text this uh, phone number, or text this number to this phone number. Um, and the result is on people's phones, you would find out um, the various people who live there. So on Ainsley Street, it was a local judge and school district trustee. Um, in 1847, one of the 44 people in town with a net worth of over $10,000. <laughs> a lot of money back then. Um, and we put these all over Williamsburg and people texted in and we logged that into a database um, and people responded in really interesting ways. Um, I think this one was pretty interesting. We're watching out for you. I'm in black morning cloth and <laughs> my partner is in a gray pole. Um, the, there was always, uh, I've admired your work on the bridge, Miss Roebling. We had a Emily Roebling uh, uh, sticker, so she was one of the ghosts on the tour. So. Um, and we were able to uh, use the data behind the text messages to begin to create maps about where people texted, what were they interested in, um, 
and so forth. And so it started to, to give us a, a better idea of how people observe space because what we found is there are particular locations where people texted more and we're, we're interested in more types of things. And, um, but what we also found from the project is people want to participate and they want to send their information back in some way. And so when they got a response, they wanted to respond back. So we got a lot of information that way. So to finalize um, my talk today, um, I think at the core of what the lab does is really think about data can expose um, different social and environmental issues. Um, and the lab borrows methods from social science, computer science, social media, geography, architecture, and art and design. And our strength as researchers is in our ability to combine hard statistical quantitative methods with visualization strategies. I'm just going to set this up. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Madhan Ratchanam. I'm the director of um, MILK, which is the Moving Image Lab at Columbia. And this is Mabel. It's, um, has already explained the blurb that I have over there. Um, so what the lab is interested in doing is exploring the relationship between the various forms of moving image and architecture and design. So what it produces is uh, short form works of animation, fictional narrative, uh, documentary, and some interactive content. And the concerns of the lab may seem a little bit peripheral at first, but I would argue that the interests are actually quite central to architecture and design, and hopefully that'll be illustrated through some of the work that's presented. Um, and I mean that not just within the academy, but also within practice as well. So I'll pri provide some context to explain all this. Um, historically, we can map the relationship between the moving image and architecture, arguably back to the Renaissance. but in a more recent history, the lab, um, with a more recent history, the lab is interested in the kind of work that's been championed by architectural figures like um, the Eames and Super Studio. And I want to be quite specific here because uh, there are a large number of architectural academics and practitioners that are interested in film and cinema. But then there are also a lot of, um, so for example, um, Greg Lynn and Tashumi, just to uh, talk about some that are within our Columbia community. Um, but then there are also a lot of filmmakers that are interested in architecture, like uh, Spielberg and Eisenstein, that were influenced by the work of Piranesi. So, uh, but what needs to be said is that both of these sets of practitioners, uh, in the end, remain operating in their own disciplines. So um, this is quite different um, to the work that's privileged by the lab where I cite examples like the Eames and Super Studio because they were architects but they crossed over to working as filmmakers and produced films and animations. And the Eames produced over 70 and uh, for Super Studio their work was so um, over the top that the only way they could explain it was more through representations rather than built work. Um, another reason is that, well, today as, um, as Toru's already talked about uh, with computing, video is also ubiquitous. And with all our mobile devices and the growing amount of video content online and academic coursework uh, that is shifting to video and broadcast forms, and the thousands of cable channels to suit every need, I could go on and on. The question that arises in the end is, you know, how can we afford not to explore what all this means for architecture? And uh, there's certainly a number of architecture schools, I'd say the majority, that have 
some underlying interest or a, a professor or a design studio, if it's worked into the curriculum, that does engage in this relationship between film and architecture or other works of moving image. But I haven't really come across many places that are looking at it very critically um, that have been trying to explore what that actually means deeply. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of examples of the work and describe why we'd call that research. Um, as Kate has um, and Jeanette have talked about, uh, I agree, it is incredibly important to talk about the shoulders and people that you stand on. No, none of this work gets created by, you know, in, in a vacuum or in isolation. And so um, at the moment, um, so there's a number of things. So looking from Milk out, you know, we of course have a relationship with the school and a lot of the, the knowledge that's sort of created gets shared back through the visionary methods of practice um, course that I run. Um, and then, so then there's uh, places like within Columbia, like the Earth Institute, where we're currently working on a project, um, which is called the Federation Map Room. And, um, and then there's schools, a whole other design school, Parsons, um, that we're working with as well. Um, this isn't, I don't see this in any way as a conflict of interest in terms of which school we privilege. It's more really about uh, that it offers an intellectual um, plurality that, um, uh, you know, because there are some things that can be done at Parsons that can't be done here and some things that here that can't be done there. Um, and then there's various projects that have come through um, that we're currently involved in with um, NGO organisations like the Red Cross and Oxfam and the government of Ethiopia, as well as commercial companies like Swiss Re and um, offices here in like LTL in Tavara. And, um, and I'm just going to speak today about two of the projects, which is Cities of Preference and the Park Tower animation. Um, but before I do, I think it's worth prefacing those with the lab's research agenda, um, just to lay out some groundwork. And I once heard research described very elegantly uh, with this diagram. And that is that on the one side um, of this line, is everything that we know. And on the other side is everything that we don't know. And this is us, you, me, everyone we know. Um, and the point of research is to be able to push this line further into um, the unknown. This is a very simple and at the most generic level of talking about research across all disciplines, um, not just within architecture. And so in looking more specifically at what the lab's trying to do, you know, there are basically two forms of um, paradigms of research, if you like, that are privileged um, within the academy. And that is the model adopted by the sciences, so largely uh, qualitative, and, um, and then the model by the humanities, which is, uh, sorry, sciences being quantitative and objective, and the humanities being qualitative and subjective. This is, you know, an epistemological concern about um, different ways of knowing. So, you know, if we talk about what's known and what's unknown, then we really have to talk about how do we actually come to know something? How is knowledge actually created? Um, and, you know, these two, what are generally been, you know, considered as dichotomies, um, do leave out a lot of other things um, where invention actually happens. And so, it, because in the lab, what's created is actual work, films, animations, and so on, it doesn't, we don't really explore things technically about films through numbers, nor do we write about films, um, you know, with text and create articles. We make work. And so, um, it means that through the making, um, we're also exploring and demonstrating the discoveries. So this really is about a third paradigm of research um, that we could probably, for at least this conversation, call design research. Uh, so what it argues, uh, what's argued here is that the practice of design is in itself an inquiry 
asking questions that lead to discoveries which make a contribution to the field that is just as significant as those pursued by the other paradigms of research established by the sciences and the humanities. So the lab has adopted a project-based model of research. Um, so let's have a look at a couple of those projects. So the first one is um, the Park Tower, which is done with Lewis Siramaki Lewis. I'm not sure how many of you might be familiar with the work of LTL. Um, I'm not going to go into the project so much. Um, I'm just going to really truncate a lot of the research that was surrounding this um, to just talk about a couple of aspects. Um, but I'll just talk, mention what this project is. This is the Park Tower, which is a speculative design project for the Venice Biennale um, some years back. And um, it's a double helix, and it was looking at car parking. And one helix is all car park, and the other helix that's wrapped in it is all program. Um, that's probably enough to mention, because uh, what was really the focus of this project was that um, the representational technique that LTL used to create their work. So, you know, there, there's, there was a period, probably not so much now, but maybe perhaps in the late 90s when you could open up an atlas of, you know, architectural work and realise that the representations reflected certain practitioners. Zaha's paintings were identifiably Zaha's. Lieberskin's drawings and models were identifiably Lieberskin's. Um, and LTL have um, been quite ambitious in creating their own representational technique which uh, uh, reflects their agenda. And it's kind of, well, it's complicated in that it takes a while to do them. So this is a really, really large drawing. I think it's about the size of that table in the end, um, where to create an image, um, it's first it's modeled up really sort of simply and crudely without too much detail and then rendered with just a single light source. And then it's printed out or plotted out in this case and traced over by hand. Um, and then you get these really beautiful markings like lines crossing over each other, smudges, mistakes that you rub and the kind of, um, uh, well, the smudges that are created with the hand over the pencil um, as the lead gets smeared. And then uh, on top of that, these things are scanned in and photographic content is laid on top. So we have rendering, drawing, photographic content to basically end up with the final outcome. Sometimes these drawings take a week, sometimes they take several weeks. Um, now, for the studio, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, the work is often, I think, quite beautiful that comes out, quite laborious, but then how would it actually migrate over to animation? And so the problem was you can't draw every single frame like this, so another technique had to be developed. And so we wanted to find a sort of digital technique that could... Um, that could replicate this aesthetic and continue this identifiable representational practice into animation for the studio. So it was um, originally followed the same structure of sort of compositing, but entirely in a digital way where a scene was render at, rendered out in multiple parts with wireframe lighting, um, different objects, um, smudges, all sorts of things. And so that, in the end, composited together, you'd get all these sort of similar attributes. So you'd get the smudges and um, the hand markings and the scratches. You'd get the ink blotting together when it's overdrawn. And you get lines that cross over each other and fade off as well. But to animate a project isn't merely about making a drawing move. Um, it brings up all other sorts of things. Um, Suddenly you have to think about narrative, you have to think about character development, you have to think about sound design, how the character, how the character actually arcs over the, whole, um, over the whole animation. So a lot of time was spent actually scripting um, a narrative that was very specific to this project. I'm just going to show you a quick 30 second clip. The final animation is about eight minutes. Um, and this is without any sound, I'm just going to talk over the top of it. But the idea was can we, in each frame, be able to maintain that representational aesthetic um, that LTL do, but at the same time um, bring out a narrative that reflects the interests and the concerns of the office that are specific to that office, 
and at the same time describe something that is about unique, about architectural practice. Um, and on top of that, um, find very specific moments or qualities about that particular project, the Park Tower project, and weave that back into the narrative. So in this case, it was about two people that were caught on different, each of, the, each of them were caught on a different helix and were trying to meet each other. Um, the other project <coughs> is a documentary, um, The Cities of Preferences, that we just finished uh, a while back, late last year, um, and it uh, was commissioned by the sub-curators of the uh, Architecture Biennale in Rotterdam, um, Interborough. And um, I had co-directed this piece with two uh, former students from here, um, Andrea Zalowski, I mean, sorry, one student from here, Andrea Zalowski, another student from Europe that I've taught in, uh, that I've taught. Um, and it was initially, the brief was initially, can we make a short documentary or an article about um, this person and the work of this person, who is Thomas Schelling, and who was a 2005 Nobel um, laureate for economics. Uh, he's done an extraordinary amount of work and was kind enough to invite us to his house for wine and cheese as he <laughs> told us about the stuff that we were interested in. Um, he's worked at the White House with Kennedy, um, done incredible things. The thing that we were particularly interested in was that in the late 60s he developed a model which is called the Schelling segregation model which described how neighbourhoods become segregated. And um, he developed it with his nine-year-old son at the time on a chessboard um, uh, using different coins. Um, I won't go into it in too much detail, but um, he explains it in his book. And it's been cited by a lot of people, anthropologists, uh, computer scientists, economists, um, policy makers, as helping explain one of those very um, unexplainable things, <laughs> shall we say. Um, but the problem was when we were trying to, when we were looking at it was that it was too abstract, it was too diagrammatic and we couldn't actually uh, find an ideal way of representing it. And so we explored it partly through animation. So how do we actually set this diagram back in the street and, um, and build it up? But then we also wanted to, in creating a documentary about it, not just do this as a kind of report, um, a journalism report on the Schelling segregation model, but actually make a full sort of over, you know, a full arc in terms of a narrative. And so we interviewed anthropologists and um, architects to talk about what is, um, what does it mean to, uh, be part of segregation or how does segregation occur and when is it congregation rather than segregation and when they do occur what when is it positive and when is it negative and so i'll just play a little clip um just to show you um hopefully we've got sound I'm going to try and just put the mic. If there's someone in the back room, could you? New York City is a, like Schelling describes only in reverse. He describes a kind of integrated checkerboard that through his modeling uh, becomes a segregated model. The, the immigrant in the city is an individual who comes and then calls his family back in the old country and she comes and an enclave grows around an, a few pioneers. So the neighborhoods grow by association and uh, familiarity and that's what produces this you know, incredible mosaic of, of different neighborhoods in New York.
most originally a male population that were the cooks in launders and you know very specific tasks for New York and for a long time it was well established in the Mott Street, Pell Street area that it is centered on today and but didn't grow too much for a long time. But American immigration laws changed um, because the previous laws gave preference to uh, immigrants from Europe and um, there was a rewriting of that law to open up uh, immigration policy. So the preference for immigration was transferred to a family connection. And so what you see is exactly what I said, the sort of family tie, who you know, becomes the way a neighborhood grows. And that's when Chinatown started to boom. I have um, heard very interesting research and papers actually about the exploitation of the new Chinese immigrants by Ch Chinese because, uh, you know, the language difficulties and things actually encouraging people not to be American, not to learn English, not to know their rights so they can be good docile workers for <laughs> the restaurants and the businesses that the, the original Chinese uh, immigrants have. Within Chinatown, of course, you know, there is a certain economic dynamism that comes out of uh, various forms of illicit or illegal activities that keep it um, dynamic in one sense while also presenting this other face to the rest of the city. Well, under conditions of the celebration of multiculturalism, it becomes a place where people from all over the city um, can go there, right? But only for certain kinds of activities. Harlem was a, a real estate project that failed. It was um, uh, middle class uh, brownstone developments that uh, were introduced in the wrong economic climate and they had to find tenants and they were willing to even accept African American tenants in their, in their new development. The Harlem Renaissance was created in that context. And now today Harlem is, is struggling to maintain African American neighborhood because of course it's a you know accessible, attractive neighborhood and has been undergoing the most extreme change and um, and with Columbia University expanding into West Harlem and um, uh, incredible uh, gentrification and new construction going on that's going through a huge uh, demographic shift. So I won't talk about all the things specifically, it just really kind of tries to highlight the differences of you know, what we were actually asking when we made the work, um, what were the discoveries that were made and who was it really meant to serve in the end. Um, because I think it's the thing about you know, why do we actually do research, well what good is it if we can't actually share um, findings with other people. And I think the having a lab uh, certainly allows for a number of things to happen and it's worth talking about the potential of each lab uh, as this in-between space um, between practice and the academy where um, students are able to also get involved in, in different ways. Um, it's something I think we'll start to go into in more detail with the panel discussion as well. Um, so the idea is to be able to open up, um, just start a conversation off and then you know, 10 minutes into it, open it up to the audience and um, have you ask questions directly to all of us already. Thank you.
Um, so, everyone can hear me, right? Okay, great. Um, I think it might be worth, just for the benefit of all the students that are here, to perhaps talk about, um, if maybe each of us could talk about uh, how students actually get involved in the labs, what they do specifically, because I think it's a given that we all teach courses here, um, and that's one way to come across the same body of knowledge, but then obviously the lab should offer something else, um, something different to taking a studio or a seminar. So perhaps we could just illustrate that to everyone, just what exactly it is that people get involved in when they partake in, um, get involved with the labs. Anyone first? Oh, yeah. Start. yeah, I'll start. <laughs> I could start at the very beginning. Um, we have, I have four students that are working in the lab with me right now, and they are doing a number of different projects. Um, Two of them are working on um, cleaning a large <laughs> database uh, that we scraped off the web, which um, we'll be using to visualize um, business information in the fashion district over time. So we've actually been able to figure out how different businesses move from this data. So they're actually working on cleaning the data and then they'll eventually visualize it. But they get involved with the lab um, by uh, we have advertisements uh, for work. Uh, they're interested in research. Most of the students that work in the lab are interested in research as it relates to spatial data information and visualization. So um, one of the great things about working in the lab is you get to learn tricks and techniques and that gets um, kind of expand your knowledge base. And so those, I think, are why the students get involved. I'd say for us, we follow a lot of different models of research. I think it really depends on the project. Um, if it's, I, mean, I think we've had some really amazing people work with us in the past year, especially. I mean, or that's really when we started. I mean, that's when we really started to work with people like that. And um, I think it runs the range from larger projects where we really are working as a team and kind of, um, um, you know, we're working, for example, to make the table that was in the Studio X show, or working to kind of broadcast the, the podcasts and the maps. Um, so I think in that way, we work in a very coordinated way. In other ways, there have been projects that we've worked on that are really student-led. Um, one example that comes to mind is the website. Um, we have this page called the Urban Landscape Encyclopedia that was started by Evan Sharp, and that was definitely his project that he started and has continued to maintain and it's been really great to see, I think, his own interpretation of the lab and its potential come out of that. Um, so I think we're interested in all sorts of ranges of involvement. Yeah, and just to add, we, especially in the case of, with the Safari 7 tours, and Jeanette gave these great examples, with the Safari 7 tours, I think we definitely have opportunities for sort of, you know, strategic strike interactions, like if you have a free weekend, <laughs> you definitely have. <laughs> Um, opportunities for interaction and um, and on the other hand it's very exciting for us to think about having longer term inter you know relationships with an AR students student or students in the sense of kind of taking something and really seeing it all the way through based on your your expertise and your knowledge um, and so I guess it's really that dynamic between the, the weekend warrior and the uh, the sort of year-long exploration um, and into sort of deeper research, which is exciting. Yeah, uh, I guess the, in the fabrication lab we have, there are some classes that are specifically related to, you know, digital fabrication and then studios and some people just bring work to do in the lab. Uh, we also have connections to a lot of the faculty through their labs or through um, projects or so on that happen. And so sometimes the students that work in the lab are students that I've never even met before, right? So um, they're coming from someplace else. And, uh, and then we have, you know, the large projects like the ones that we do over the summer where we'll advertise and so on. But there are, a, on occasion, you know, very small, I didn't show a lot of the smaller projects, but just a student or two will come up with an idea and tell me, and, and that's about as much organization as it actually takes, right? 
So there's a wide variety of ways. I'll just add to that. Um, since our cloud lab just started, I get the benefit of not having students yet. <laughs> um, but somewhat, for us, it's definitely this kind of awareness of this front of um, you know, this kind of ubiquitous computing that's opening up uh, the kind of sp new spatial terrain, right? I mean, obviously, we par horizontally connect a lot, right? Like a lot of data, media, resources. Um, and our, not to kind of split hairs, that I think we all kind of um, reach this point where there, there's all this, there's this new front of kind of spatial, let's say, um, terrain that's somewhat opening so fast that we don't even see the edge and we're, s we're just kind of jumping in. Um, at least for our end, I think the, to even develop a software, it, it's not somewhat of a, you know, a quick turnaround. So I, I do see it as a kind of long-term um, project and especially in the kind of community of like developing application. Um, I think the, the kind of um, culture in, in software development is that you kind of extend a previous research. So if there's anything that we would distinct from running a studio is that it kind of extends the previous. So the research doesn't get lost. Usually with studios, one body keeps one project and goes to the next. So as even though the professor may have an agenda, uh, the body of knowledge is somewhat lost. But I think with these labs, the beauty of it is that there's a kind of growing knowledge in every of them. Um, and the moment that you kind of participate in any of these is that you already have a reservoir of knowledge that you can tap into and you're there to kind of extend it. So as much as there's not much on the table for the, the cloud lab, it is already open to that kind of context because uh, wh whoever is directing the lab, I think for futures, I think directors <coughs> start changing too. And there is this kind of consistent agency of the laboratory but not the director so the directors could change or perhaps should change you know in five years time or something yeah. um, I don't, I'm not saying for everybody <laughs> but, uh, Revolution. but, <laughs> but the, the point to get across is that the laboratory as a kind of platform is not so much there's this kind of director leading something but it is a kind of a big kind of platform for things to develop further so there's a knowledge that's kept in the la la laboratory that ca gets extended by more students. And the participation link can vary. It could be a few days, it could be a whole year. I, I think that scale is kind of dependent um, on the kind of project and um, agency of the person. Mm. Um, <laughs> just to kind of answer my own question, <laughs> at least my own lab. Um, <laughs> The, uh, I think there's been three types of work, um, cr uh, three different ways that students have got involved in the work. So there's been um, the lab initiated project um, where we've conceived of one and then pulled people in to be involved. There's the other kind which is um, that it's externally um, asked of us, so like the cities of preferences. And then there's the um, there's another example of a project which I didn't show today, but a student Cheryl Wong, who I had taught in the past, approached me afterwards and said, "I'd like to do an independent study. You know, can this come through?" And um, and we've worked on it, and it's something that the independent study has officially finished it for academic purposes, but we're still working on the film. For it's ongoing. And for her, it's just a way of being able to author work um, that couldn't really happen anywhere else. Um, and looking at the work in all three ways, they have very different values in terms of the people that they're supposed to speak to. Um, and as Tora mentioned, the, um, the kind of the agency of them. Uh, and that's, I think, a, a really interesting point to actually talk about because I think in today's presentation, what, um, presentations, what's come up is that it's it's probably not, um, uh, it wasn't made um, so clear and deliberate, but I think it is un under the surface, so I'd like to um, 
ask everyone to kind of talk about it, but really for each of us to describe what the agency of our work is. So who does it actually talk to? I mean, I could sort of be presumptuous and say, you know, Sarah and Kate and Jeanette, your work, you know, you've already talked about the way that it started to influence policy, for example, um, and has the sort of, uh, what, you know, talks to these other communities that we don't often engage with um, directly. And Toro, um, you know, f for you, I, I always thought that a lot of the work that you've done and having known your work over the years, it's really so much about, it's a bit hard to say, but it's m more about looking at different types of practices as well, amongst other things, and charting out new terrain of, well, if all this stuff is happening, then surely there are these spaces being created and opportunities for new types of studios and uh, way of practicing. And I think for what um, Phil's lab, the Fab Lab and my lab would have in common is that it's really a learning through making. So making films or making actual objects, that that's where the learning and the research and the discovery is actually made. Um, but again, I don't want to be too presumptuous. It was more just to kind of get the ball rolling about if you could talk about where you've had the most influence, where you believe the agency is at the lab. Um, I, I guess I'll go first. Uh, I think the, the kind of nature for Mark and I that we code a lot or program a lot already opens this kind of notion of you're designing an application. So application so much focuses really clearly who your audience is and like what the, the kind of software should be doing. So somewhat the audience is somewhat clear um, and who the user is clear. Um, and I, I think that's, that's just coming from this kind of background of coding it implies that kind of nature. So, um, and just to kind of add to that, I think more, more so for, you know, what, what, what is kind of opening up is, is really this, um, again, I repeatedly say this kind of new form of practice is that it's really ubiquitous. Like you can change one day of literally filming or algorithmically making a film, um, all of a sudden that data can be transformed to a certain visual that communicates radically across many people at the same time. So the agency is not so much um, about the kind, of in the, the kind of lab, but it's the agency of that one person. It's so large now. Um, that can reach so diversely to so many people, I think that's that still kind of remains um, open-ended for many people right now. And I think especially for like an architectural practice, since someone's considered the kind of global brain, right, that we know across so many things, um, that once that, that kind of ties to this kind of agency, um, I think we have the most benefit in this thought process. just say one of the things that is exciting for me about the lab um, concept too is that you're not necessarily thinking about the receivers of the information as you are conceptualizing it and when Jeanette and Glenn and I sat down and we were brainstorming about what eventually became Safari 7 it wasn't it, it, it had so much you know now that we have made it it has so many aspects or different audiences that have essentially discovered it but I think that's one of the great things about the lab format is that it's basically to some degree an experimentation based on a set of concepts or shared ideas and and that somehow that that finds its own voice or it finds its own audience and the same thing with the the bird the bird guidelines came out of basically like volunteering mm. <laughs> with the audubon society and then kind of finding something that was there and that could be expressed and then that in a turn found its own audience in the sort of like leadness of the of green building industry but, but it, it seems like that that's something that is particularly exciting to me <laughs> about it that it has this sort of open and diffuse kind of you know not direct application or yeah. direct audience i think another thing too that interests me about research is that it sort of changes the kind of client model of architecture that i think we depend tend to depend on and um while that's important i think it's really fabulous that research 
basically becomes a way for us to establish the projects that we want to start doing and kind of be advocates for design and kind of pay a tag for like what, what it is that designers do best. Um, so I think, yeah, just for one second. Yeah, yeah I feel like it's a, it's a similar way we work in the fabrication that because you know, typically when you're constructing something, you do have a client, right? And you have somebody to answer to for certain things. And this allows us a chance to develop our own questions to then answer ourselves, right? So uh, maybe it's, it sounds referential, but it's also, um, you know, we usually have to deal with other people too as well. So it isn't just a sole author. So and I think the ability to do research that comes, you know, from another person. And so, you know, you engage the problem solving technique, but also develop your own problem to solve. You know, the combination of that as a, as a, you know, a faculty member, but as well as students, I'm sure, um, is very valuable. Yeah. I would say <coughs> that the lab has, I mean, our lab has maybe two agents. I mean, one, one of the things that we are, are trying to do is affect change, or uh, I, I think highlight um, underlying patterns in the community that might help affect change. And so um, a lot of the research projects we do are to expose issues, whether they're criminal justice issues or air quality or environmental issues. We hope that a message gets across to, to expose a certain pattern. But I think on the other side, we have a research community that's interested in um, new forms of data, and there's kind of a growing community that's thinking about how can we use crowdsource data or how can we use um, uh, data that's collected on the web and what are different what can we say about it scientifically and I think so I think our projects also have that as an agent so we're writing and developing papers for those journals well at the same time as thinking about how we can use our visualizations to tell us the story about place yeah, but I mean, I'm not sure how many people actually know how the labs got started and what drives them. I mean, it's, it's fairly mysterious, I guess, for many people, particularly the student body. But it really was um, because there were a large number of teaching faculty adjuncts that were doing really interesting things, but they were only teaching a couple of courses here. And so they had a very limited capacity in, which in how they could engage with the school. And so the labs were set up as this kind of middle ground between the practice of so many of us as faculty members outside in our interest, but also being able to mediate between practice and the school as well. And being able to do things that didn't fit in the curriculum, the standard curriculum. And so if you look at it, um, the labs have a very interesting place because at the school here we have coursework masters everyone goes through. And then we have a PhD program, which is largely thesis or policy based, um, but there's nothing that's kind of project centered. And so a lot of the work that's created here is uh, projects. And I think I could probably say this, that for all of us, it really begins with a kind of an enthusiasm for practice, like that we care about this subject matter to want to kind of set up a lab around it and, and start exploring it. Um, and so you really do see how that stuff, the enthusiasm can then be sculpted by so many different directions afterwards in terms of who comes to be involved in the project and what happens. Um, I do want to open it up if there are questions. <laughs> now that it's 20 degrees in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 30. <laughs> I mean, there are, oops, there are quantitative <laughs> methodologies that really require certain ways of working and adherence to certain models in which, and they have specific names. I mean, you describe very succinctly, I am using this particular method to basically work through that data. And I don't think anybody else really says, 
you know, there's this particular method. And I was curious, given that architectural methodologies are far more elastic in terms of, of how one works, um, how you found working with kind of these quantitative methods in relationship to other kinds of methods of working? Because you, you said particularly like yeah. on the visualization side, right. you start to deal with a whole other kind of set of, uh, of criteria right. that affects the work. And it seems like you're really negotiating, I think that. And I think that's been really hard or difficult given the kinds of education that we have for architecture. That's what I think is very interesting. And that's what I wanted to know, given you know the survey of the labs, how is that inflecting back on educational models? Because I think we're still trapped in a much older model of education about how practice works. And then I think practice, particularly through NAB, is trying to clamp down on the deliverables of the degree, but the reality of the field is that practices are in fact diversifying how they work so that you have in firms research laboratories you know, that are operating. And so what I think is very interesting is that all of a sudden even in practice you're getting these other ways of working um, mm -hmm. that are now there. And so how do we start to negotiate you know, those ways of working? And I think you represented exactly kind of where that <laughs> maybe fissure or fracture actually is yeah. in the current. I mean, I think that, um, uh, for me, I guess I was trained in both methods, so it's easy for me to combine them, but at the same time hard because it actually uh, represents twice the amount of work because you're almost doing <laughs> twice <laughs> two projects, right? If you, uh, I mean, I guess like for if you take the Getty project for example, the amount of work that it takes to run the you know Moran's eye and statistics and what you would typically see in a geogra geography paper is just that final chart of the Moran's eye <laughs> output, which isn't that compelling. And so I guess for me, it's really important to include the visuals because I think it helps bring the message to a larger uh, group of people who might not otherwise access it. And so I think that's why taking the quantitative and then applying the visualization has become an important practice component for me because it brings the idea to more people than it might have otherwise served. Um, but I also think in my teaching, I always emphasize the need to think about the quantitative and qualitative because if you only approach a project in the quantitative, this is my idea, <laughs> somebody can, but I feel like if you only approach something quantitatively, you're going to miss um, much of what's out there. And so I think that GIS or different kinds of spatial statistics programs help highlight areas of concern or areas of interest, but it's the qu qualitative information that really layers that uh, place and um, can tell us more about what's going on there. So I think it, it almost helps us highlight an issue, but if we use it as the only way to understand the city, it can be very problematic. I guess like one one question that kind of probably is useful is you know the measurement in in kind of recognizing the kind of degree of innovation. So I because all project is in some way or another uh, innovation, right? It kind of iterated or evolved through a kind of uh, condition. Now the question is probably for me once that's kind of I mean I, I for to a certain degree architectural education trains everyone to become kind of an entrepreneur, or innovator, or a, a thinker, right? So a thinker constantly thinks of the next situation. Now, I think even though that said, the, the creations have a fitness, right? Someone is put into the world and see what lasts or what's more recognized, or there's a kind of degree of evaluation. Now, I think that process is rarely discussed. Like, we, we let the fitness of the world kind of <laughs> let, let our things grow, right? So we put it out there and see, we can market it, et cetera. But to a certain degree, um, couldn't we even then, I mean, doesn't that turn back and uh, kind of evaluate the projects in a sense? So this is the feedback part of like putting a project out there and then you have a version two, version three. Someone like software where there's always another version Sometimes like Autodesk, it becomes worse, right? But at least there's a kind of iterative idea of like going back to that project 
and what would be different. I think many cases of, I guess architecture in general, since it's a one-off, <laughs> mm -hmm. there, there's not a moment to iterate. But I think with researchers, there's a moment to iterate because there is a kind of case of a topic. I think that's why that uh, um, Subway 7 project, the Safari 7, goes to Mumbai or goes to, because there's a platform to identify something. Now the success again, I think that you'll have a different iteration for you know, Brazil. You won't do the same one, perhaps, right? So I think that's the kind of, potentially what I see in the lab is that there's an opportunity to iterate a project um, rather than not being a one-off project as the usual architectural project become. And uh, again, I repeat that kind of notion of studio project also becoming a one-off of the one case studio not having the potential to iterate again. So in this laboratory, I think it is an opportunity and when I say you extend the previous knowledge is that you're kind of refining it or iterating through. Um, so that's my kind of thought to that um, distinction of a laboratory to like other cases. So I guess my question is, um, I'm not sure how many on the panel have a background um, before architecture or, I mean, I know that Kate Orff, you did landscape, right? You had mm -hmm. a background in landscape architecture. And Sarah, you had one in, in geography. Um, so I wonder how the kind of research that you're doing now, whether whether is an ex is it an extent extension of stuff that you that you had prior, um, like um, how do I say? I know it's it's very research oriented, but is it like an extension of stuff that you had prior, like in in the discipline of landscape architecture? I did my undergrad in landscape architecture, and there's not many projects that you would say that are very similar to Safari Seven, at least in terms of that discipline. Um, and in geography, there is a history of, I guess, re uh, visualization, but not. I, I'm not sure, like how, is it cutting edge? Is what I guess what I'm trying to say. Is it something different from the discipline, and is that influenced by the kind of like, um, by the mingling with architecture? I guess by that cross fading or something, or that kind of thinking. I'm not sure. I mean, they're both. The, I mean, the design disciplines the same way, but um, I, I'm not sure. Do your friends back in, uh, like your undergraduate <laughs> friends, are they doing the same thing? <laughs> um, <laughs> <another one>. No. <laughs> no, I, I think it raises a great question, question, which is disciplinarity and sort of what, what Nate was talking about with, you know, there's the NAB, you know, the architectural accreditation and landscape architectural accreditation, like this kind of funky boundary that exists, you know, that, that, that requires a discipline to be coherent and have standards and be, you know, licensed and registration, all the things that in, that are involved calling something a discipline. And then I think there's what's so exciting about the lab is that you're kind of not approaching things through a disciplinary perspective, not that you're not informed by that. So of course, I have training in civil engineering and ecology and planting and hydraulics and all these kinds of things. But so I might look at something differently, but but I think that's what is so exciting is that <laughs> about the labs is that you're coming at something through the perspective of an idea, not necessarily through a discipline, which is what how a traditional school is organized in terms of, okay, here you get this degree, and here you get that degree, and you take that test, and so on. So, mm. so I, would, I would definitely say that's where I'm coming from in general. <laughs> so it, the lab is a great forum for that. I think um, it's particularly, uh, uh, I think there's always an autobiographical element to all of our labs and because we initiate them ourselves so we kind of are trying to bring something unique that we can come from that's worth pursuing um, but the other thing is of course you know I, I remember hearing this statistic and I don't know how much truth there is that for all the accreditation sort of hoops that a school an architecture program has to jump through 
the school here is kind of interesting because at least in the AAD program, people coming here to get a master's that they don't really need to, in order to practice. Right? So then it's all about saying, well, can we explore all the things on the periphery? Because we know the things that are central because we've already got accreditation, so to speak, for that. Um, but then whilst you can do all these things, um, for us, uh, you know, so some people come here so that they're no longer having, so they can do things they can't do in practice, right? And this is students and faculty, I believe. But then at the same time, we then go and set up labs so that we can escape some of the limits of academia, but at the same time are unencumbered by the issues of practice, like clients' budgets, you know, and those sorts of things. So we try and occupy this sort of space where we can try and, if we, if we are able to sort of go back to that wonderful utopian idea of free research, mm -hmm. and we can just really explore what we want to because we're just really deeply interested in these questions and hopefully bring other people to be as fascinated as well and go on that ride. But um, I think that's, you know, that can sometimes be a bit navel-gazing. Um, so at the same time, you can go back and say, all your influences have come to this point to create this lab. And other times, you know, we only really, what good is research if we can't share the discoveries? So then it's actually really about looking back outwards to the community as well. Yeah, I in, as a counter, I think I would Please. argue that when I, you know, I practice an architect, I don't worry as much about the budget of my clients as I do when I'm We all have our budgets too. It isn't all, you know, yeah. uh, utopia. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I so we don't just like dis dismiss right. everything and just do whatever we want because we all also work at grants. We have budgets. Yeah. We have our kind of clients, be they different types of clients. Could even be the school or the students in general. So it's a different type of way of looking at it, which which is good because it gives a different perspective than than what I do in practice, mm -hmm. which is less more about the DOB than different way of dealing with things, which is, which is interesting. I'll, I'll kind of say this one question just because there's so few people, but... <laughs> I'm going to tell our secrets. Right, right. <laughs> no, no, not your secrets. <laughs> we have a... We have <laughs> <secrets. Yeah. laughs> you know, I mean, it's a, this question of, like, cutting edge or innovation is a very critical one. So, I mean, to rephrase that question, I, I'm, I'm questioning into myself, does innovation happen at this school? Right? Is the school the real innovation cutting edge? Just a question. Columbia. I mean, Columbia or institution in general, right? Like just just developing apps, you know, for us is part of our kind of experimental, you know, terrain. I mean, you'll have these crazy, you know, twelve-year-old doing a YouTube tutorial on making an app. Not that the kind of tutorial part is the important part, but the kind of in innovation can happen so fast now in outside the school that you know I think it's questioning well how how do we catch up or how do we rethink the kind of role of innovation as an institution so how does a school kind of think of institution and really kind of gauge that problem because the reality is the the, the real kind of fitness function is the outside practice Right, I mean, somehow there's then the practice of you know PhDs and like you know thesis statements um, or kind of all, all this kind of other kind of standards that things are evaluated. Now, that that being separated, I think can't be spoken that school is innovating. It could be innovating within itself as a school, as an institution, because there's a standard of measurement, right? The right kind of bibliography. Um, you know, facts that are aligned to d define a kind of um, paper, but when when I, not to kind of make the economic measurement of a project the kind of bar, but I think the question of that, you know, does innovation happen at the school? Can it kind of mutate into what are what are the standards are we measuring all these projects by? That's kind of the ultimate question for me. Like, if we take the academic standards and we evaluate. I mean, all projects are so innovative, <coughs> but then we go outside, 
and then have a different standard brought in and measured, it will be a different kind of evaluation. So I think that has to somewhat be clear somewhat. I mean, maybe it's just a self kind of clarification, but at least that's an issue um, that has to be discussed more as a kind of institution um, because everything is becoming more faster, more, uh, you know, instantaneous. Um, it, we don't have time to wait, right. you know, so. Right, so there, there seem to be kind of two parts to that too, because one is like, what is the role of institution to not just, <laughs> I mean, to, to like be an institution in the way that, you know, political institutions right. and acro across the world serve to be kind of continuity of certain, and then on the other hand, you know, how I would say, you know, you had all these charts. I was so impressed by your charts. <laughs> you know, like how does innovation happen? Or I'm sure there's like a whole spectrum of ways that innovation happens, but I think probably the two most kind of like first pass ways would be that innovation happens through kind of like deep research into one thing, like, you know, the particle accelerator 50 years in the underground that's <laughs> slack, you know, and you're, you're kind of learning something. And then there's certainly another methodology, which is innovation happens when um, people talk to each other, you go normally talk to each other in the case of the anthropologist and the, you know, in, in your movie, you know, right. and the economist. Um, and so, you know, I think it's interesting to think how Columbia, you know, how it's succeeding in both of those realms. Um, and I guess I'm just flashing back to this question about the dis disciplinarity, because certainly that's something that I think Columbia could use a lot more work on because you know when you are admired in the academic kind of structure it does make it very difficult I'm sure everybody has their own story at this table about grant writing and Sarah working with the, you know the Earth Institute and, and the sort of difficulties that the sort of very real tangible difficulties that happen on I would say both of those models and so and I would totally agree that the lab isn't this kind of you know ideology of freedom but at the same time it is represents for me the symbol of the idea of freedom <laughs> even if it's not the actuality thereof but this this notion where you know these different models of, of you know deep research into one kind of way of thinking and testing it testing it testing it and then also this kind of you know sharpening of ideas as they hit other disciplines and other perspectives is is kind of it's definitely one way of trying to like kick the ball down the field you know and then kind of make address the question of like what is innovation in I mean one 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 kind of just side note to that is like computer science becoming this obsolete department mm -hmm. because it's getting integrated to all departments mm -hmm. so you know medical uh, biology chemistry they just it absorbs that and right. a discipline in itself but just talking about Turing machine is just a crazy thing yeah. you know <laughs> I mean we only know, need a few people for that right but I think that just has to happen almost for all disciplines in the sense that, you know, architecture is about human body, so we should be doctors. You know, like the, the cross pollinization of the departments almost happen, has to happen like computer science in the sense that, you know, which, which is this kind of cross, right? Mm -hmm. If the focusing of that research has been this kind of century of institution, because there was like, cutting up departments, right? You do medicine, you do biology. It's actually not true, everything's interconnected. So in some ways we just have to break that walls. Like, I, I think that is the modern time, especially with computation where everything is becoming flat. Everything is like, information is everywhere. You can access any kind of information. And I think it's, it's gonna be the kind of future of institutions. It's just, it can't be divided like that anymore and it has to be broken sideways. So maybe we should be, I mean, even within the lab, we should be probably doing projects sideways. <laughs> and beyond that, architecture school has to be going to, you know, the music, the engineer, and really kind of not just, oh, I can take a few courses, but really integrating as a curriculum, would, I would think is the kind of future of like an institutional power is that it's all there. We just have to break the wall which you cannot gain outside of an institution, right? You can tap into the internet of reservoir, but it's not structured. Like you have to structure it yourself. So the beauty of the institution could be if it breaks the sidewalls, 
that it becomes this kind of meta curriculum of you know hybrid, right? So it's a new generation, it's a post-human institution, um, but institutions are extremely slow, hard thinking, and never happens. So, um, I mean, it's crazy that I mean architecture is kind of relatively young too. Like I, I don't know, the Harvard Architecture School was researching that right. at a certain point, it's, it's like, like <laughs> a drop in the bucket in terms of mm. when it was actually separated out, and now it's right. all the and MIT decisions are I think there's also this question about how we do interdisciplinary work, because I think there's like long been this tendency to think that, well, what we really need to do is we need to get an economist, and we need an ecologist, and we need a mathematician, and we need the computer scientist, and the architect, and if we just get together, we're gonna do it, you know? And I think it's really important to recognize like how those collaborations happen and what perspectives are represented within that field. Because any five economists are going to disagree with each other completely. Any five architects are going to you know, think different ways. And I think the real question is like how do we kind of cross these fields or how do we actually understand that the dialogue that happens between them? And I think that question is also kind of parallel with this question of that Mabel's bringing up with the, the issue of the quantitative and the qualitative. Because one thing I wanted to talk about as we're talking about research is just this kind of question of like how we take knowledge in and what we do with it. Because I think we've so long had this preconception that research is like, okay, I need the facts and now I'm gonna know what to do. And, and that like research is gonna prove the need for a project as, as though they're like scientists kind of um, arguing in front of Congress for a certain bill and then like we would then know what to do. But the real question is that we don't really know what to do with those facts all the time and we don't really know how to act on them or which facts to read in the first place. And I think that's really where architects do come in. I think coming back to this question of like, what's the disciplinary expertise of architects? I think it's kind of important that we're both, it's both kind of fabulous and, and horrifying that we're never at the right place for a grant application. Like <laughs> we're never like within the NSF nor the, the, right. uh, the arts grants. And, and it's, it's like, we're kind of trying to do both never really either and the, the fact of that is really the way we bridge between quantitative and qualitative so it's like I think we really just have to get rid of this problem that that on the one hand we inherit facts and then we <coughs> act on them or that designers lead by doing the innovative visionary projects I don't think either of those ends are really working for the profession and I think it's really the idea of the way that architects interpret implications of knowledge that kind of can bridge like this kind of interdisciplinary action and can actually kind of erase this kind of problem of, of quantitative and qualitative. Yeah. I think um, so much of that uh, um, problem of, you know, not being able to find the right um, uh, grants and things is that I don't think designers generally do a very good job of demonstrating our expertise other than just creating good work, but we never actually share what it means to be thinking as we do as um, an interface designer or an architect or a landscape architect. And I think if we could do that, it, we would actually have more agency as well. I mean, I always hear about how um, design is just such a fashionable term in business education at the moment. And so there's schools like um, Rottenham uh, in Canada, which is kind of considered one of the top six business schools and places to get an MBA. Um, and they run it as a design program and they use the word design everywhere. Yeah, and design MBA. Right, they have design MBA. So the idea being that if you're a designer, you're a problem solver, but rather more than that, that you can take two ideas that appear to be in conflict and actually find a third solution that satisfies the world's you know, needs. And so this is their sort of packaged, boxed up version of what design is. And they've managed to sell this really well. And I can tell you they make a lot more money doing kind of simple design than we do probably here doing being critical design. So why is it that we can't share our expertise with the wider community to kind of really say we're actually doing all these really inventive things? I mean, I know that there are design schools that have been contacted by the Obama administration to work out how design can play a more critical role policy is actually implemented, not just in making the slideshows look pretty, but actually being there at decision-making points and what's important to society. So if we could find a way to kind of demonstrate our expertise um, and share it, 
I think the best way to do that is for us to be able to undertake research more critically in more varied ways where we can see it serving the community immediately. And I think Jeanette said it with the CAG, I mean, you showed examples of that today that definitely do that, in which having done the work first, then you find that people come to you rather than feeling that you have to set that up from the beginning. Well, I just want to say thank you for complimenting <laughs> your work. I think it's actually really, it's really encouraging for us that that's the level of detail that you're involved in. Like, you know, you're doing the research I mean, I just think that, that these kind of research labs are really offering those opportunities for collaborations across disciplines with other professions and practice to produce new bodies of knowledge through our, as you were suggesting, Mother, our expertise. And I think given what's going to probably happen at the other end of the shake up of the field, that these are really kind of critical models for how one works, you know, even as a postgraduate from this institution. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>